Hello, I'm Christina Lopez, a Fox 26 News reporter, and we are on the precipice of something historic. Yes, this Sunday, Mexico is poised to elect its first female president ever in its history. And there are nearly 100 million Mexicans who will cast their vote, eligible to vote, for its first female president. And we really wanted to gain some insight locally on what this could mean for the more than 53% Latino population right here in Fresno County. And for that, we turned to one expert who can really shed some light and share her insights on what this could mean. We're speaking with Dr. Anabella Espana Neira. She is a faculty with the Chicano and Latin American Studies at Fresno State. We speak with her now. Uh, Dr. Neira, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Tell us uh, a little bit about what Sunday's historic election could mean for the people of Mexico and really for those uh, living here closer in the valley, the Latino population here at home. Sure. Yeah, I think for Mexico, this is uh, definitely a historic election in that for the first time we have two female candidates that are leading the polls. And so we've had female candidates before in Mexico, but not by the main parties leading the polls at the same time. And so really, um, I think in all likelihood, on Sunday, we will see a female being elected to uh, Mexico's presidency for the first time. Um, and I do think this has been a trajectory we've been seeing in Mexico since the 90s, uh, when Mexico really starts to adopt um, gender parity laws. And um, we have you know a long trajectory of sort of modifying those laws to really um, incentivize the political parties and the party elite, which had historically been, has still historically been dominated by males to open up spaces of leadership uh, for women. Um, and so in some ways, it isn't as surprising that we're here uh, with two female candidates, but at the same time, it is a, definitely a historic moment um, where uh, people, uh, the two significant choices are both females from the dominant parties. Um, so I think that's on the Mexican side. Um, uh, thinking about local Central Valley, um, Mexico allows uh, for um, Mexican citizens who are living abroad to participate in elections. And so I wouldn't be surprised if a significant percentage of the residents are going to be voting on Sunday's election. Um, they have made it progressively easier for uh, uh, Mexicans living abroad to participate in elections. And so I think we're likely to see an increase in votes um, in the last presidential election. Um, something like, I think it was around 70, 70 plus percent of for, um, votes cast abroad came from the United States. Um, and we did see uh, the candidates making their way to Los Angeles uh, last year at some point to do some campaigning. And so there's definitely recognition um, of the importance of the Mexican diaspora abroad. Um, Mexico's, um, you know, does depend heavily on the remittances that the diaspora sends. Um, and so I think in general, really regardless of who wins, um, there's an understanding that the diaspora is important and that they need to be kind of looked after as much as Mexico can. And that often means kind of pushing um, U.S. government to kind of recognize and respect the, the human rights of Mexican migrants living abroad. Um, so I think we're unlikely to see any change there in that across the board there's an understanding that the Mexican diaspora is important. And could this uh, see any potential violence in the streets of Mexico this weekend as uh, they gear up for those elections? I mean, we've known that yesterday, just as recently as yesterday, uh, the mayor was uh, assassinated as well uh, you know, during broad daylight. I mean, is this something that you know uh, voters should be concerned about? I mean, we definitely have seen a, uh, an increase in political violence in Mexico over time. And this last election uh, sort of peaks um, I think, you know, in general, that's a broader term that so Mexico is not isolation, you know, in the US, we've also seen an increase in political violence. And so it's part of a broader trend that's definitely worrisome. Most of the election of uh, the political violence in Mexico has been around local offices. Um, and so it really, more than anything, signals the importance of local offices, mayoral offices and um, city councils for illicit organizations, um, right? Because having, um, having a friendly, um, local officials to them uh, means there's less persecution, they can do their business as usual. Um, and so most of the violence has been geared around those kinds of candidacy and at that level, I don't think we're likely to see a really significant spike on Sunday, uh, but it is definitely worth noting and uh, highlighting that 
it was a very political uh, violence, kind of heavy election. And that's concerning um, in part, again, because it signals sort of the, the growth and the dominance of illicit organizations in Mexico. And I'm sure security will be incredibly heightened at those polling stations as well. Yes, I, sorry, I lost your feed for a second and I couldn't hear you. I'm sure uh, the security will be extra heightened, you know, as- Yes, as I think so, yeah. Right. Um, Yes, we've definitely seen um, the electoral authority coordinating and greater extent protecting the candidates, um, especially as we went through the election and, and the violence sort of increased. Um, and I think we're likely to see a very kind of um, heavy security presence on the day of as well, especially in those areas um, where, you know, in those states where violence tends to be high um, and those contested local elections. Tell us, what do you know a little bit about the background of uh, the front runner right now, uh, Mexico City's mayor? What can we really say about her? I mean, she is leading in the polls. She is the favorite and she is poised to really uh, make history on Sunday. What could you share with us about that? Yes, the candidate, Claudia Sheinbaum, is really a very capable candidate. You know, she's had this challenge where she is definitely the favorite to win and ha was more or less handpicked, supported by the outgoing president. Um, and so she's had to, throughout the campaign, really, you know, play this dual role where she has to dis make herself distinct as her own person, her own candidate, while also, um, you know, writing the coattails of a very popular president who has 60% approval ratings. And so, you know, when you're trying to get elected, you're not going to dismiss that 60%. Um, and so she's sort of been playing that line of trying to uh, make herself this thing and as her own person, not a puppet, but at the same time, signaling very strongly that her government would do a continuation of the policies that have made uh, Lopez Obrador so popular in Mexico. Um, but she is definitely very capable on her own terms. She was the first elected uh, woman, uh, Mexico City mayor. Um, she has a long career as a scientist, as an engineer. Um, and, and so she's, you know, definitely capable. Um, and I think that's definitely something that we see in uh, women candidates um, across the board, not just in Mexico, that when they get elected for these positions, they tend to be very qualified and in many cases overqualified compared to the male counterparts, right? And so we definitely still see those gender norms where uh, women have to be kind of excellent plus to get that same position that a male candidate might not need. Um, and so in, I think in both terms, both the top candidates are a really very well qualified politicians. Um, and so uh, in, in that sense, uh, you know, the norms of kind of the, the gender, um, the gender pressure is very much at play as well. We see it in the candidates themselves. Very good. And on a global stage, what does this mean? What does this signify? I mean, our neighbor, you know, to the south is electing its first female president. I mean, we have not been able to do that yet here uh, stateside. So what, you know, can this really teach us or tell us on a global stage? What's your perspective on that? Yeah, I think, you know, Mexico's election is, is sort of, it's part of a, a bigger wave in Latin America of really prioritizing gender parity. And so, as I mentioned, um, Mexico, like many other Latin American states, have put in place uh, laws that really incentivize or or demand that political parties uh, really take into account female candidates um, and put them in electoral positions. Um, so Mexico will be joining the ranks of Argentina, Brazil, Chile, in Latin America, where we've already seen female presidents. Um, I think it also sort of signals um, that, again, the fact that they're both top candidates from the dominant parties are female candidates really is a strong signal because um, we're not likely to see then, you know, what we saw here in 2016, where you had a female candidate and a male candidate. And so, you know, you really see some of those gender differences in reporting. Um, and that hasn't happened as much because the two top candidates are female, right? So in some ways that has made it easier. Um, I think it, it also shows the importance of really taking 
um, gender parity uh, into account and being deliberate about it, right? Not only just talking about the importance of uh, having female in leadership positions, um, but really uh, thinking through what kind of policies in place help those women come to those positions because as Mexico and other Latin American countries exemplify, um, unless you directly address it and uh, force those gatekeepers to open the doors for females, they don't, it doesn't happen naturally, right? You kind of have to force their hand in many ways. And so I think, uh, you know, it, in order, if we really want uh, more female representation in the United States, uh, both the presidential level and in Congress, we really have to think through well, what kind of policies can we put in place to, to help um, open spaces for what are very qualified female candidates uh, who are just not taking into account. So many takeaways, so many lessons. I mean, the eyes of the world are really going to watch what happens on Sunday. I mean, regardless, a woman will be elected a female president, I mean, for the first time in Mexico. So it, it really, it is historic for a lot of reasons that I think yeah, whoever does win, I mean, it's, it's going to be one for the record books, absolutely. Yes, I think this is going to be a big break. And, you know, the script of representation, the idea of having a female in this powerful role is matters. Right. I think in some ways it's going to be a challenge for them as well. Right. Because there's a lot of expectations going in. And so whoever gets elected um, has a heavy burden um, to carry. And it's going to be, you know, just like the, the world, we're all going to turn on Sunday to see what happens um, and see the most probably the most likely candidate get elected. Um, you know, over the next six years, we're, there's also going to be scrutiny in terms of, well, what does she do for, um, you know, gender equality in Mexico? Right. A country that still needs. Uh, right with high levels of femicides, of gender-based violence. Um, and so what are her actual concrete policies going to be in, in addressing that? We saw a little bit when she was mayor of Mexico, um, but you know, this is on a bigger scale with a security issue in Mexico that's that's a huge challenge for anybody coming in. Um, and so also there's this idea that, you know, where is some that are we placing, you know, are we expecting a female candidate to all of a sudden come in and in six years solve a problem that hasn't been solved in 20, 30 years? Um, and so that also tends to be very kind of um, a gender response, right? Where uh, if she fails, it's all her fault, even though every other president hasn't failed in the same way, right? Um, so we'll see how that plays out, but it will be an interesting country to watch, I think, over the next six years. Um, and thinking about US-Mexico relations, having a female president is also going to be interesting, given that we have an election coming up in November as well. Absolutely. And you did touch on uh, this word quite a bit already in our conversation, gender and gender roles. And uh, typically the, you know, the presidency is typically we've seen men lead countries regardless around the world where they are. Um, that's typically who is leading. And so, um, you know, in in a country like Mexico, where machismo is really big, and even here, uh, you know, in the valley, we have a huge Latino population, and uh, men are taught, you know, to be strong and, um, you know, practice their masculinity. I mean, even in a role like a presidency, you know, having a female step into that role, I mean, are we just eliminating these kind of gender stereotypes, uh, electing a female president? No, I mean, I wish we were just like with that one, sort of solving a, you know. 100 years old problem. Um, unfortunately, no, but I do think it matters. Like the symbolism of it matters. Right. And so having a female in that leadership position, being in charge, uh, that matters for the women who are coming behind, you know, her. Um, and also it matters for just um, setting norms. Right. I think we also know that sometimes when you have uh, women um, coming to this position of power, there can be backlash, right, with kind of more conservative groups and um, especially maybe um, conservative males, right, really kind of pushing back against being forced to uh, open spaces for women. Um, and so I think we may see some backlash, but the symbolism of having descriptive representation that is having people who look like us in leadership positions has an important effect. I don't think it's a magic bullet, right? And so I don't expect in a year's time for gender-based violence or, um, you know, in Mexico to be resolved. Um, it isn't going to happen. I think it will be, uh, it's on, it's, 
it's just not going to be solve all the problems, but it sends important signals to um, the whole society about the ability and capability of women to lead and to hold important positions um, that do trickle down, we know from the research across all spheres. Um, and so it is in that sense momentous. And I think it's something worth celebrating, um, even if the next six years then it turn out to be a really, um, you know, a huge challenge for whoever is going to be the president or presidenta in this case, yeah. So incredibly important, all of those key points that you've made. I mean, your insight, I mean, something that you've studied, your expertise really highlights a lot of these layers and it is so layered and we have to understand what that means going forward and this country too. Uh, our final question to you today, uh, Dr. Esperanjera, is um, what can this teach uh, the U.S.? I mean, we're watching closely. I mean, do we see a female president in our lifetime here in the States? Well, definitely not in the next election. We know that. Uh, but I think I think increasingly as we see more women leading countries, especially neighboring countries, because I think a lot of time in the U.S., we don't necessarily, you know, a lot of people may not have noticed that Argentina's president was a woman or that Chile's president or Brazil's president was a woman or even across the wall, the pond, right, in Europe where we had female leaders. But Mexico is our next door neighbor and there is a lot of contact with Mexico and the Mexican presidency. Um, and so I think that definitely having, you know, our next door neighbor, um, elect a female to this prominent role, it increasingly normalizes the idea that women can and should have cap the capabilities to lead countries. Um, and so I think all of that adds the, the blocks to what we need here in the U.S. so that the next time we have um, a president, a female candidate, right, that they're, the playing field is more even, right, where there's less questions about her ability to lead and just assumption that, of course, she's capable of leading. And let's look at the policies that she's proposing. And that's what matters, right? Not so much the gender or whether she's actually capable, right? That those questions of capability um, and ability are, I think, more and more kind of being set aside as we see more and more examples of women in powerful positions. Um, I don't think we're quite there, but I think increasingly they're sort of being set aside. Um, and so I do think that the next time we have a female candidate in the US, we're less likely to see those discussions, right? I, you know, than at least within 2016, right? Um, and so moving forward, I think it helps. Um, and, and hopefully also, I think one of the things we know matters in terms of having women in these powerful positions is that it encourages other women to also consider uh, running for uh, candidates, right? And so um, if you see a female in, in this powerful position, you're more likely as a female to also think that you can do that role that you're capable as well. And so you're more likely to um, run for office as well. And so I think that that is also something that trickles down. And we can expect that perhaps even in the Central Valley and more local elections, right, where you see, uh, especially with the Mexican American community, uh, that you might see more women sort of then contemplating public office as well, um, having this really prominent example that they're going to be very aware of. You've heard the saying, the future is female, and we're seeing it play out to our neighbors in the South, um, mm -hmm. you know, reaching ever so closely to the United States, and maybe even on a local level, local government, as you mentioned, that is a really great point. Um, mm -hmm. maybe we will not just uh, continue to see the first, but maybe this will be a new precedent, a new normal going forward. I think so. I think, uh, increasingly, I think it's harder to turn that tide back. Right. And so we're likely to see more and more progress, even though sometimes it's slow progress, but at least we're moving in that direction. Absolutely. And hopefully women are less scrutinized, especially in public office. Exactly. Maybe that won't be a headline anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, so that we start to evaluate their job as as we evaluate anybody's job, right? That the fact that they're women is sort of okay. taken off the table and it's just, is this a capable politician, right? Are they proposing things that I want to stand behind, that I want them to do? And and they whoever's gender is no longer relevant. I think that's sort of the ultimate goal. Um, right. I, like I said, I think in Mexico, because both women were female that kind of normalized things a little bit more. I think that was really great push forward. Um, but I think more and more, we're, we're more likely to see that. Um, at least that's, that's what we're hoping for, for sure. 
Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Annabella Espana Najera, thank you so much. Uh, you are joining us as the uh, faculty from the Chicano and Latin American Studies Department in Fresno State. We thank you so much for your expertise, your insight, and your perspective on this uh, global topic. Yeah, I was have my pleasure to talk to you at this really important historic moment, and we're all really excited to see how it plays out on Sunday in Mexico. Thanks for Absolutely. having me. Thank you so much.